Well, currently I'm working on uh, the main project is a show called, uh, now what's the name of this show? No, I can't <laughs> I'll Be There. It's the story of the Four Tops. And I'm working with the legendary writers, Brian and Eddie Holland, Duke Fakir, who was the last remaining member of the Four Tops, our producer, Pam, uh, producer Paul uh, Lambert. And uh, we're in the process of casting and doing readings of, a, of the book. So uh, that's what I'm going to do right now. Well, I did the, I did the radio show with Freeman Gosselin and, Freeman Gosselin and Charles Gorell. And I was on the radio show for uh, at least three years with Eddie Rochester Anderson. I was Eddie Rochester Anderson as a kid on the radio show. So at the same time, I did uh, the Jack Benny show, uh, Amos and Andy, CBS Playhouse. And uh, that was in the good old days of radio. Do you kids know what radio is? Well, Mr. Basie, I didn't work with the orchestra. I worked with a group called the Robins. And at the time we went on the road with the Basie Orchestra, we were the stars. And he was like the accompaniment. That legendary man who was one of my mentors. And uh, he became one of my mentors as, as did uh, Marshall Royal, who was the alto player and, and really led the band. And, uh, but I was very fortunate. In fact, the, last time, the first time I came to Atlanta, I came with Lou Rawls, and that was the week that the hotel the, on Peachtree was, with the elevator that went up and down, yeah. they were trying to get me in that elevator and say, oh, man, I can do that thing, you know. <laughs> so that was, and so you know how long ago that was. That was, uh, that was my first trip to Atlanta. I did Rangers for Frank. I did a couple of tracks for the Basie band that they played. Uh, but uh, I did the Rangers for Frank. It was... It was, I was doing, at that time I was with Capitol. So I was doing the arrangements of Frank Sinatra and Tennessee Ernie Ford, Ella Fitzgerald, Nat Cole, uh, Tennessee Ernie Ford. I was, I was busy every day doing sessions. Uh, Frank was special because he came in, uh, the first time I did a session, he walked in and said, hi kid. And uh, yes sir, Mr. Sinatra. And he, he came and said, let's run this down. He ran it down two times, and he sang it and left. And uh, I didn't see him again for uh, about three weeks later. Richard Pryor was doing a show at the comedy club. And I was sitting with a bunch of musicians. We went to see Richard. And uh, Mr. Sinatra walked in with Mia Farrow. That's who he was with at that time. Uh, all the guys said, hey, man, that's French Sinatra. You know him, go talk to him. Uh, no, I'm not gonna go there. You know, I'm gonna, I mean, I just worked with him one time right now. You know, he he doesn't even know who I am. You know, so Sinatra went and sat down, and uh, in the intermission, uh, Fred Sinatra got up from his table and started walking toward us. And the guy said, "Man, he's coming over here." And uh, he walked close to the table and said, "Hi, H." He says, "I'll see you again soon, huh?" And walked away. Man, my stock went. Oh, yeah. Well, you know me and Frank. You know, <laughs> we're good boys. Yeah. No, he was. He was really a cool cat. Yeah, so. I was with Ree for forty-two years as a conductor and arranger, and uh, it was a wonderful forty-two years. Uh, it came to her by accident. Because her, her conductor was, um, oh boy, I said, my, my, you have to go slow with me, okay, let's go. But her conductor was one of my mentors, and he always told me, I, I, you're going to work with Aretha. And I said, sure, okay, you know. You know. So he had an unfortunate, got, had an unfortunate timely death, and Cecil Franklin called me. And said, uh, H, uh, this is Cecil. Well, Cecil, yeah, yeah uh, Cecil Bright, Aretha's manager and brother. Oh, okay, we're in Los Angeles, and uh, I want to talk to you about working with Aretha. So Cecil and I met, and uh, we sit there and talk. I have a picture I can show you, it's really a nice picture. And uh, we talked, hadn't met Aretha yet, and uh, he said, uh, Can you 
worked with us. I said, sure. So the first job was the Circle Star Theater in San Francisco. And one of the interesting things that happened that night while we were getting ready to go on, now remember, this is my first job. I, somebody came backstage and said, listen, there's a comedian out front that wants to, to, to be on the show. So I said, well, why are you coming to me? He said, well, they told me to ask you. You know, you can ask Aretha. So I said, oh, okay. So I went back and said, uh, Miss Franklin, there's some comedian wants to open the show, you know. She said, well, I'm not ready to go on. So I let, let me go on for about five minutes. I said, okay. Uh, she said, what's his name? I said, let me go find out. Oh, his name is Richard Pryor. <laughs> so that's a, that, that was my first meeting with Richard. We remained friends. I, I did his TV show and we remained friends for a long time. Um, he introduced me to another little guy named Paul Mooney. So it, it's, a, it's a very small, uh, we have a very small world. And when the stars fall in place, everything works out fine. It's it's part of it's part of progress and technology. Yes, when I started, we recorded on quarter inch tape like this. Everything was in the same room at the same time. Then I saw it evolve to where they had two track, where you could put the singer on one side and the band on the other side. Then it went three track where you could put the singer in the middle and the music on both sides. Then it went to four track, eight track, 16 track, 24 track, 32 track, 48 track. I have tapes of all of it. In my, uh, in my garage now, I have tapes of people like uh, Leon Russell, uh, Billy Preston, uh, Marvin and Johnny, who you probably never, you never heard of. They had a record called Cherry Pie. Uh, the coasters, the original coasters with Colonel Gunther, with they, Shirley Gunther, uh, Sly Stone, the OJs. And now, so the progression came from that quarter inch tape to where we have 48 track tape. And now we have unlimited tracks because we have a digital computer that you can have a million tracks on. It's still music. I respect it all. It's, uh, to me, if it's, if it's, if it's not in the song and in the words, it doesn't matter what you record it on. It's, 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 it has to touch people. It has to touch their heart or their nerve or something. So it doesn't matter what it's recorded on. I respect the rapper guys. They're genius. They can take one of my songs and do something to it that I will never recognize and sell more copies than I sold in the last 50 years. They can sell more copies in one day because they can put it on the internet and a billion people can look at it at one time. That's, that's progress. Personally, I wasn't very good in keeping my tapes. I kept them in a storage area that was too hot or too cold. But they're still good. What you have to do with the old tapes, they do what they call baking. They bake them in a confectionery oven for the, the 24 track have to be baked for 12 hours. The two track have to be baked for four hours. You bake them prior, then you can run them across a machine head and then transfer them to digital. And that's what all the companies have been doing, transferring to digital, transferring to digital. So they can retain all the scratches and all the, the noise on the record. It's still there when you transfer it. They, uh, originally they started to clean it up then they find out, no, people want to clean. They want, they want to hear the real, real sound. Now, I have lots of vinyl. Vinyl is coming back. Uh, we call them, we call them, it's been called vinyl, platters, uh, LPs. <laughs> it's the same thing. The name is, the name is very strange. And uh, so my tapes are, are, are being transferred. Uh, the funny thing about the baking, Ampex was one of the first companies, they started to bake their tapes. Anybody that had Ampex tape, they could send it to Ampex, and Ampex would bake it for free. And then, But it took sometimes two or three months because there were millions of tapes going back and forth. So me and my smart self, I went to Ampex to take my tapes to see if I could get it done faster. And the lady said, no, Mr. Barnum, it'll still take you about a couple of months to get it back. 
I said, well, you know, I'm going to go home and bake them myself. So I started out the door. She said, well, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go put them in the oven and bake them. She, oh, no, you can't do that. You'll blow your house up. I said, what do you mean? She said, you have to, they have to be baked in the confectionery ovens at 125 degrees for 12 hours. So Mr. Barnum went out, and I have now 12 confectionery ovens that I bought. And I baked it for all my friends. And... Uh, then, but after you bake them, you have to immediately go and transfer them because in a couple of months, the, the same thing will happen. They all need baking again. So, but I was gonna, I was gonna go home and put them in the oven. <laughs> It's not about being perfect, it's about that feeling. It's about the feeling, that's yeah. right. Because, and you, but you know what? As, as imperfect as the music was, well, I listened to a lot of my old tracks, my old tracks, said, boy, ooh, that sounds horrible. But there's a feeling there. I was, I was listening to some of the old Little Richard stuff we did, and the drummer, he didn't need a digital metronome. He kept the same tempo all the way through and 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 really like when i when i first started we play a, an event we wouldn't play but four songs through in the whole night we played the, the first song which would usually be whatever whatever uh, some some dance song then we play our hit and say in the days of like marvin and johnny would be cherry pie and uh, then we'd have Gina and eunice take kokomo and then we play fine home that would be a four hour set the drummer never varied with the tempo. That all the tempos were right, and I mean, you, I'm talking about fast stuff, you know. Where, and now we all have to do that with a digital machine, because some of the musicians don't take the time to practice, so they can stay in that same tempo all the time. So, uh, but it, you know, that's what it is, and uh, I appreciate all of it. So, we we use all of it. Well, I want to give, I want to give, uh, I've been very, very fortunate to work with some great artists. And all of them, people who are the favorite, they're all my favorites, they're all good. But there's a couple of, couple of people that really stand out in my life. O.C. Smith, Lou Rawls, and the Osmonds. Because human, Lou and O.C., we both had falling outs in our career. I've been at work for, for a few years, and then we had, we had a, uh, uh, an impasse, and then we got back together. In both cases, they were gentlemen enough to call me up and say, H, uh, we should get back together. Whatever our differences were, and it wasn't nothing bad, it's just, it was usually about money or something, you know. But they called me up. And then the Osmonds, they really taught me how to take care of business, how to, how to, be on time, how to, how to, you know, treat the, the musicians, uh, how to, how to, you know, like, you know, you, when I came today, you said, well, everything's not set up, but it will be set up, and we'll get it done, and it's going to be a great show. So you don't have to get all flustered and mad and yell at people and scream and everything. You know, it's, 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 uh, it, it's, it's our little community of creative people, Everything from the guy who's setting up the mic to the guy who's taking the picture to the guy who's serving the food. It's a, we have our little community, and nobody should get upset and all bothered and I'm bigger, better, smarter, more important. Because if it all doesn't work, the show doesn't work. And the people don't want to hear about problems. They only want to come and enjoy themselves, which means that we win if we are cool because people come to enjoy themselves and all we have to do is let them enjoy themselves. If we have a bunch of problems on this side, they'll feel it and they want to enjoy themselves and then we, we don't win. So we, we have automatic, if we just, you know, like I say, everything will get set up, we'll have a show and people, they will never know that something was late or something. They'll never know if we don't tell them. Yeah, all we got to do is let them perform. Well, you know, as a as a coming up musician, there were only two or three people that I aspired to be like: Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Louis Jordan, and Spike Jones. <laughs> now, now, 
when when I when I first met April and Edward, and uh, you know, all I could do was tell them, say, your, your dad said some real nice words to me about how I should act and you know don't give up and you know and things that, and those those are the kind of words that stick with you when you have hard times or maybe the money ain't right sometime. Those are the words that stick with you to say, hey, it's gonna be all right tomorrow. So don't don't if if you bum out today, you don't get hit hit today, come back tomorrow and swing the bed again, you know. And uh so Duke and uh, when you when you look at what he did and the music he did and the people, the people he made happy with his music, the the, the lives he changed with his music, like Lou said, the babies that were made while I was singing. <laughs> you know we we have we have it made. We have, we have the we have the best thing going. We can communicate all of us from different parts of the world. We're all today. We're gonna have people here from overseas and different languages we're all going to get together and we're going to have a hell of a show tomorrow and if you miss it you oh boy i'm telling you you better be here there will always be award shows there will always be you know trophies and given but sometimes the people who really deserve those trophies the people whose shoulders are all of these stars are standing on are, are, are neglected. There wouldn't be an award for, say, uh, Snoop Dogg if somebody in the studio or somebody who had created that piece of music or that piece of uh, the, the words that he's using. So those people need to be honored. So the, this Hall of Fame is reaching deep and fi finding out the people who really created the foundation for these awards. And maybe it's not a Grammy, but one day it will be the Grammy because people will look back and say, you know what? I would have never known about that person had the organization had not honored them and brought that person to my attention. And I never knew how important that person was to the whole industry because if he didn't sell 20 million records that week, nobody knew who he was. But now I know, and that's what's important. So you have to be commended for what you're doing and I hope that one day, you know, who knows?